Actually, I was going to ask you about autism. Probably it's a good time to talk about autism. And what would you say to the young woman who plan to have a baby? You know, what do you tell them to prevent the happening of autism? I think they need to have uh, testing of key nutrients that can that are that they must avoid excessive levels of or deficiencies of. And I think paramount there is folates. We now know that folates. If a mother is deficient in folate, we now know that they are prone to spinal bifida and other neurological problems. So it's very important that they correct that deficiency. And if they do that, we now have clear evidence that that condition, spinal bifida and other neurologic problems, are are disappearing or much lower levels. Well, what the world has forgotten is that how about women who are already, because of genetics, extraordinarily overloaded in folate. So that's one example. I think what, what needs to be done is a, do- a doctor, an obstetrician, or whoever the doctor is, needs to identify folate and a number of other nutrients. Uh, B12 is another one that seems very important. And there are others. And, and they're now doing these cord blood studies. Are you familiar with those? It's, it's, nobody's talking about it, but they're, they're brilliant studies. They, they, what they are do- now doing is they're taking tens of thousands of mothers and they're doing experiments on controlled experiments to identify the effect of prenatal care on the baby. And the reason is the cord blood, the umbilical cord blood has the DNA of the baby. And at first they were doing this to get healthier babies, make sure their birth weight was higher and that they were just naturally healthier. They've done a lot of that. But they've done some recent experiments that are really interesting. They show that folates make your DNA undermethylated. Okay. So they need to make sure that folates are in normal, healthy levels during a pregnancy. And I think that has a lot to do with environmental exposures too. Uh, I think I think we're going to learn a lot about how to protect a mother, how to de- protect the developing baby during the nine months. And I think that's going to eliminate a lot of problems. I believe. For example, I have, I've been doing recent research where we get an indication that we might be able to prevent schizophrenia. We're learning that schizophrenia risk has a lot to do with folate levels during the nine months. And that women who are deficient in folate, they're prone to one form of schizophrenia and those that are overloaded in folate are prone to, in this case, the undermethylated form of schizophrenia. And, I, and we have clear evidence that we can prevent or re- greatly reduce the risk of schizophrenia by normalizing folates B12 and a few other important factors. I think that's coming. I think we can, I really believe in 20 years, we'll be able to eliminate schizophrenia from society if this is done properly. So the current testing for B12 folic acids are reliable to judge whether we have enough or deficient or excessive amount of folate in our blood? Well, uh, they're not perfect. And there's always the uh, challenge of, do you want to do uh, uh, whole blood cells? Do you want to do um, uh, serum or plasma? And however, uh, looking at this and looking at the experiments going on by these different organizations doing the core blood studies, I'm finding that it doesn't seem to matter which one. It looks like plasma and serum are, are pretty much the same. And that actually it correlates nicely with, with whole blood and with our red blood cell membranes and all those. So it doesn't seem to be critically important, the testing. But the thing that's surprising uh, when you look into it is, is the question is, what is the range, the normal range? Doctors call it the two sigma range, the, the 95% range of, of folates in, let's say, women of childbearing age. It's very large. It's a factor of 10. So because of genetics, some people are innately innately very deficient in folate. Others are innately overloaded. Uh, I think their their babies are at risk. And but it's not only folate, it's other other nutrients too. And it looks like B12 might be as important or more important. And possibly others. We're just just learning. But folate, folate, if a per, if a pregnant woman takes folates, their child will be definitely more undermethylated than if they didn't do that. That we know. Six different organizations have found. And they did these organizations when they first discovered this, didn't want to report it 
they were nervous because folates, they're, they're methylating agents. They, they're effective at methylating. But if you give them to a pregnant woman, their DNA becomes under methylene. And now we understand why. They're, we, know, we know the mechanisms. But that's something the world doesn't recognize yet. And they will quickly. Well, and others are going to report this. I mean, it's, it's going to be something um, that's really important for human beings. Wouldn't it be great to get rid of schizophrenia? What a, what a terrible, cruel disorder for a family or for an individual. For the autistic children, they already got it. And uh, is there anything can be done? Well, one has to focus on, um, I, I've had at one time with our, my clinic, we had the largest number of autistics in the world and in the, in the, by far the world's biggest chemistry database. We have 6,500 cases and it, it's such a cruel disorder. I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking. Every case is heartbreaking. But what we learned is that if you get early intervention, if you can begin treatment before the age of three, you have a very good opportunity to certainly to treat the disorder, make it far less significant, and in many cases, essentially cure the patient. And I've, I've had, we have many of those cases, but we have many more that were we began at the at the age of six. The you can get more progress with a two-year-old in, in in a month than you can in a year with a six-year-old. Early intervention is so important. It's got to be, and it's got to be diagnosis. There's also um, a problem lately in misdiagnosis. The, these autism spectrum disorders, they are not autism. They're completely different from classic canner autism. And uh, more, than, more than two thirds of all people now diagnosed as autism spectrum do not have autism. Mm -hmm. Their brains develop more normally. They're not. It, whereas uh, autistic brains, if, if you have a child with true autism, by the time they're 10, 12, 15 years old, if you analyze their brain, their, their brains did not develop normally. They did not develop normally. Now, one thing I think is really important is metallothionine, which I mentioned before. When, one thing we learned in our database is that virtually every autistic child has extraordinary copper zinc imbalance and metallothionine is not function, functioning. And we know that metallothionine is not only important for copper regulation, it's very important for development of the brain. It has so much to do with the brain actually developing. We think that's one example of something that you can do for autistic children. But you need to correct their mental metabolism. They're all under methylated, every one of them. 99% of true autistics are under methylated. And, and yes, you can help them with our therapies, but you need to do it before the brain development is completed. And by the time of age three or four, 95, 98% of brain development is completed. And, and if you don't correct that early, they're going to have those problems, some problems the rest of their lives. So these, the earlier treatment definitely is more productive. And, but the correcting their uh, biochemical imbalance like on the, on the methylation is still useful, even the children are older, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, I think I'm, I'm sure that I'm not, I can't explain in detail exactly the mechanisms, but I, I think it makes sense that to normalize that important aspect of a baby's development, uh, because we now know that methyl bookmarks, whether they're attached or not attached to promoter regions next to every gene, that determines the rate of gene expression. So if your methylation is abnormal on your DNA, your gene expression will be abnormal, your brain development will be abnormal. Now, you and I, I think, are both undermethylated. Am I right? There are advantages to being undermethylated, and there are negatives. The advantages are people who are undermethylated are competitive. They're determined. They don't give up. They, they tend to be OCD. Uh, and if, if you channel that into a career or into a sport, all the great athletes are undermethylated. I've tested some of the greatest athletes in the world. I used to work with Olympic champions and champion boxers and the really good ones are really under methylated. They just want to succeed and allow them to become doctors and, and scientists. The negative is they're prone to low serotonin depression. They're prone to obsessive compulsive disorders. They're prone to uh, addictions. If you were to do a study of people who are uh, heroin or cocaine addicts, most of them, you'll find a strong tendency of under methylation uh, on and on. So there's positives and negatives.
maybe you and I have been somewhat lucky to avoid the really bad things that could have happened. I think one thing they will be afraid if we correct their undermethylation, they will lose that competitive age. Is that possible? We worried about that, but we now know it's not true. And the reason it's not true is the methyl bookmarks on your DNA are permanent. When we treat people and try to affect gene expression, we're not changing those bookmarks, those innate tendencies. We're not changing them at all. They, they remain. So one thing we learned after doing tens of thousands of patients is that if you take an undermethylated or an overmethylated person and adjust their methylation in the body, it doesn't change their symptoms and traits. It really doesn't. If you, if you have a obsessive compulsive disordered person and you know that they, they have their DNA is undermethylated, doesn't have the right number of, of these regulating methyl marks on their DNA, that's not going to change after you, after you improve their methylation. And they're still going to be competitive. We, we've taken great athletes and made them better athletes because we could eliminate their anxiety. But we didn't eliminate their, their, their capability. We, we were concerned in the beginning that they might lose the nice part of that, the nice right. part of the method. Okay. So we're going to finish with the last question because you mentioned the two-third of autism, as autistic spectrum disorder doesn't do not have the autism. How do yes. we separate them? How do we differentiate them in our diagnostic process? Well, let me try to explain quickly. Um, for back when I was running the Car Pfeiffer Treatment Center, we did a number of scientific experiments with universities and, and with the government. And the reason was we had this huge number of, of autistic families coming every day. We might have 10 or 15 families every day coming to our clinic with an autistic child. What we did is we got the approvals, did the ethics, and got the approvals to take blood samples from classic cases and, and do that in conjunction with researchers from universities and others. And so I had a, um, so back in, uh, I think it was nine, 2005, well, early on from, from 2000, 2005, I had a, a, a researcher who worked for me. And every time a family would come in, I had them study the case to, to determine whether or not they had classic autism that would be suitable for an experiment where you want to be really careful or not. And up until, uh, actually it was 1995, what was happening was that this is like one chance, in a, one time in a hundred, there, there'd be something else and it wasn't quite right. Maybe a head injury or deprivation of oxygen at birth or a, a, a more of a developmental disorder. But in, in general, almost all the cases were proper for the experiment. And then right at that time, over a period of two or three years, there was a huge change. And uh, it was because of this whole, idea of an autism spectrum. And it actually was, it happened originally because of financial reasons that autism spectrum was becoming, um, there were people who were giving tests and treatments and there were autism doctors and they want, and I, I, I hate to say this, but I think they just wanted to have more and more patients. And what we found was that after only two or three years, we no longer, uh, when we would test the incoming children diagnosed with autism, that more than two thirds did not have autism. So we had to be careful to select those with what we called true canner autism. Canner was the man who first discovered autism and reported it. And those are the people who get better because they don't have their brains not properly constructed. And so there's all these doctors and others and families saying, how wonderful, my autistic child is no longer autistic. But you can easily tell if, I mean, there are, there are, I now have patients who come and say, uh, my 10-year-old has been doing pretty well in school, uh, but he now has this autism diagnosis. Well, there's 11 classic symptoms of true autism, and he might have four or five of them, four or five of them, and, uh, but not have the case. If a person has true autism, they're not going to be speaking properly at the age of three. They're not going to be, there are all these things that, that true autistics cannot do, and, it, and it's so heartbreaking for those families, but it's a, it's a different animal, so to speak.